Welcome to today's Chain Engineers Newsletter Live program. I'm Jeannie Harshaw, and today we'll discuss control strategies for electrified heating HVAC systems. We'll start with some of the drivers for electrified HVAC systems, then we'll move into specific system configurations and dive into operating modes and control sequences, including Guideline 36 and defrost management. And then we'll close with an overview of tools you can leverage to design chiller heater systems. To cover this topic today, we have three guests, Rick Hyden, a trained systems development engineer, Brian Kirkman, an applied solutions engineer, and Ken Pruner, our design assist project manager. So Rick, can you get us started? Why electrify building heating systems? That curiosity alone may have drawn you to this ENL. The answer to that question lies in the definition of the word decarbonization. Decarbonization relates to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions released into the atmosphere. Reducing or eliminating carbon emissions into the atmosphere is critical to us meeting our climate goals. Why are we talking about decarbonizing the built environment? The reason the built environment is getting so much attention is because it is estimated that 40% of annual global CO2 emissions comes from the built environment, and HVAC accounts for roughly half of a building's energy use. Much like transitioning cars from gas to electric, we must start to think about decarbonizing buildings as part of the overall solution to addressing rising greenhouse gas emissions. As you think about decarbonizing, we know that you must grapple with confusing regulations, commitments, frameworks, certifications, and terms. Many states and local municipalities have taken on carbon reduction strategies on their own. As you think about what all of this means for your building, it's important to ensure that you follow the right guidelines and most updated federal, state, and local regulations. Decarbonization goals and regulations typically require emission reductions by scope. Scope one emissions are direct on-site emissions, usually due to burning fuels, on-site, by fleet. Scope two emissions are emissions associated with energy and utility purchases to operate the business. It includes electricity and steam. Scope three emissions are emissions from the value chain related to all of the entity's activities. These are not directly controlled by the entity itself. Now, when we look at solutions, you see that scope one is addressed through refrigerant management and electrification. Scope two is addressed through energy efficiency and renewables. And scope three is addressed through reductions in embodied carbon. When we use the term decarbonization, we are referring to the combination of these solutions. Now today, we're gonna to focus on electrification to reduce scope one emissions and specifically electrified heating systems. Taking a step back, electrified heating system in some form has been used in buildings for quite some time. In response to the 1970s oil embargo, US electric utilities incentivized heating buildings using waste heat from electric transformers and lighting. Remnants of these incentives can be seen in the beautiful nighttime skylines of today. Common electrified heating systems used in buildings today include electric resistance, such as baseboard heaters and VAV reheat coils, as well as electric boilers, which are all 100% efficient. That sounds good, but there are much more efficient and sustainable means to heat spaces, and one of the most efficient is by using compressors and heat pumps. Heat pumps are typically at least three times more efficient than electric resistance heating. And in growing numbers, regulators, energy providers, and most importantly, customers are saying, use a heat pump. Today, we'll explore design and control of typical hydronic air to water heat pump systems, as well as the emerging storage source heat pump system. We'll provide control strategies for highly flexible systems while considering energy codes, design conditions, and equipment limits as well as get an overview of industry-leading design tools, all in an effort to help you confidently say to your customers, let's use a heat pump. Now let's pause a moment for terminology. For this session, heat pump units can reverse the function of the refrigeration evaporator and condenser. Chiller heater units can control the either hot or chilled water temperature and are also known as water-to-water -water heat pumps and heat recovery units controlled at the chilled water temperature while producing as much beneficial heating as possible. 
Thermal energy storage allows energy to be collected at one time and dispatched at another. Coefficient of performance, or COP, refers to the ratio of the useful energy out of a system to the work input. Higher is better. A building automation system, or BAS, controls system operating modes along carefully designed sequences that are informed by points of information. System points include variable data such as return hot water temperature and equipment communications such as defrost delay. General considerations for heat pump applications include building type and size, space constraints, and access to heat sources such as groundwater or wastewater or the air. When using air source heat pumps, the outdoor climate is particularly important to selecting a system type as we'll discuss later. Financial considerations like utility incentives and tax credits can also be important factors, especially when considering thermal energy storage. Stepping back a bit, ground source systems are very efficient, but locating a heat source can be challenging and expensive. Air source systems require greater outside real estate and have limits at low outdoor temperatures, but have a near unlimited heat source. Stored source heat pump systems enable heating in cold climates by sourcing heat from the building and the air, which also enables downsizing the air-to-water heat pumps. Design resources are available for each system type. Note that the stored source heat pump system can be more complicated control, which is one of the reasons we are here today. And again, today we are going to focus on air-to-water heat pump and stored source heat pump system control. Using air as the energy source and sink, air-to-water heat pump systems can be arranged in a dual-feed, decoupled, four-pipe distribution system. The system consists of heating and cooling distribution loops that are decoupled from the plant. In this case, the plant includes three air-to-water heat pumps, each with a fluid pump, tempering line, and a highly flexible valving arrangement. The air-to-water heat pumps can all be used for heating, or all for cooling, or two for heating, and one for cooling. This system is very flexible and also contains hot and chilled water buffer tanks and optionally could include an auxiliary boiler or heat recovery unit. Its yoga instructor would be very proud. A comprehensive cooling and heating control strategy is needed to maintain occupant comfort, minimize energy consumption, and ensure reliable and sustainable operation. System control must account for equipment limits as well as occupant comfort. For instance, a typical air-to-water heat pump operating map is shown, demonstrating the achievable hot water leaving temperature versus the ambient temperature range. The area inside the lines indicates the heating operating map. You can see that at about 45 degrees ambient temperature, the achievable hot water temperature decreases from around 140 degrees down to about 90 degrees at zero degrees ambient temperature. And typical air-to-water heat pumps are unable to operate below zero-degree ambient temperatures, after which auxiliary heating is required. Typical BAS systems enable auxiliary heat starting at 5 or 10-degree ambient temperature. In addition, at times, air-to-water heat pumps must defrost the outdoor coil, which in turn chills the supply water for several minutes. Loop volume, discussed in a prior ENL, is an important design mitigation tactic for this event. And enabling BAS defrost delay requests further ensures both occupant comfort and machine reliability. For these and other situations, the equipment and BAS must coordinate operation. Next, Brian will review operating modes essential to achieving reliable control strategies. Thanks, Rick. For the basic air-to-water heat pump system, we have the three fundamental system modes Rick just mentioned. We have cooling mode, heating mode, and simultaneous heating and cooling modes. Depending on the heating and cooling mode requirements of the building, the building automation system will coordinate the heat pump staging, the heat pump modes, and valve positions in order to ensure the plant is providing the necessary capacity. Let's take a look at a control strategy used to ensure that the required heat pumps at the respective modes are available to the system. One of three different priority modes could be assigned to the air to water heat pump plant. These include heating priority, cooling priority, or balanced priority. In heating priority, any time there is a need to stage on another heat pump in the heating mode, the building automation system will attempt to start another heat pump in the heating mode. If there is a heat pump that is not running, 
but in standby and available to operate, then that heat pump will be added to the heating system and commanded to run. If there are no available heat pumps in standby, but there is at least one heat pump operating in cooling mode, then because the automation system has been set to heating priority, one of the heat pumps operating in cooling mode will be switched to heating mode and added to the heating system. As you can imagine, the cooling priority mode will operate in a similar fashion, but give priority to operating the heat pumps in cooling mode. In the balance priority mode, the system will naturally stage the heat pump chillers up and down in their respective modes as required by the building load. But in this mode, if all heat pump chillers are operating and there is an additional call for heating or cooling, the system will not switch the mode of any of the heat pumps and they will continue to operate in their same modes. As you can see in this mode, the plant and heat pump operating modes are subject to the time dependent natural staging up and down of the heating and cooling loads in the building while in this mode. In addition, the priority mode can be automated to automatically change based on outdoor air temperature. A good starting point would be to have the automation system set the priority mode to heating priority when the outdoor air temperature is below 40 degrees, cooling priority when above 60 degrees, and balance priority when in between. It is a good idea to keep these outdoor air temperature set points adjustable so that the building operator can make modifications based on observations specific to his or her building. Determining when to stage an additional heat pump on or stage off a running heat pump will be similar to that of a typical plant. Two common methods used to stage heat pumps are staging based on temperature and staging based on capacity. For temperature-based staging, if the system water temperature is not meeting the specified set point within a specified dead band for a specified period of time, then another machine will be staged on. In this example, the system chilled water set point is set to 45 degrees. If the system chilled water temperature exceeds the set point plus dead band value of 47.5 degrees for only a few minutes but then returns to less than that, the add timer is reset. Once the temperature exceeds 47.5 degrees for the add delay time of 10 minutes, a heat pump chiller will be commanded to cooling and enabled. In a similar fashion, for capacity-based add staging, another machine will be staged on when the system capacity exceeds a specified capacity for a specified period of time. To determine when a machine should be subtracted, the similar but reverse concept can be applied. A machine can either be staged off when the plant delta T has been lowered, especially in a primary secondary plant, or when the capacity of the running units is low enough to satisfy the system capacity upon subtraction. Here's an example of capacity-based subtraction. We can see here that the building automation system will calculate the estimated relative plant capacity after a heat pump is subtracted. Once that value is less than the subtracted delay time, which is 80% for 20 minutes in this example, the building automation system will subtract the heat pump. Next, let's discuss a small but critical control component used to help ensure that heat pumps stay online and do not shut down on a low return water temperature diagnostic. When in heating mode, it is important that the return water temperature into the heat pump is not allowed to get too cold. As we learned in the previous section, there could be times where a heat pump transitions into the heating mode from the cooling mode and the water entering the heat pump could still be cold. This bypass valve around the heat pump will be controlled by the automation system to ensure that the water temperature entering the heat pump stays above the manufacturer's required minimum entering water temperature. And speaking of valves, let's have a discussion about the role of isolation valves and considerations when controlling them. In a typical air-cooled chiller system that includes isolation valves, there is usually only one isolation valve installed at each chiller. In the air-to-water heat pump system, there are two isolation valves installed downstream of each chiller, one on the chilled water piping connection and one on the hot water piping connection. When a heat pump is operating, the isolation valve associated with the heat pump mode will be open to that system, while the other valve associated with the other system will be closed. When the heat pump is not operating, both isolation valves will be closed. As long as there are no heat pump isolation valves on the return water side of the heat pump, then the expansion and contraction of the hydronic fluid in the heat pump will be absorbed by the hydronic system and their associated expansion tanks. 
And though our recommendation is that only downstream isolation valves are needed, as shown here, owners, designers, and engineers will sometimes prefer to install isolation valves both upstream and downstream of the heat pump in order to further isolate the chilled and hot water systems. If the system is to include both upstream and downstream isolation valves, the control sequence of operation must be specified to ensure that a heat pump isolation valve is always open to either the hot or chilled water system so that the water in the heat pump and piping can expand or contract as it heats or cools. Let's move on to some additional configurations that can be applied to the air to water heat pump system. In certain climates or system layouts, auxiliary heating in the form of gas or electric boilers may be installed as part of the system design. Or perhaps heat pumps are being added in a retrofit project to meet decarbonization goals, but an existing gas boiler is being left in place. There are various reasons for using auxiliary heat, which we won't go into here, but more details about auxiliary heating can be found in a previous ENL on electrified heating. Regardless of the reason for using auxiliary heat, the auxiliary heating can still be staged in the same fashion as a traditional plant. Staging options include staging based on needed capacity, staging based on outdoor air temperature, or staging based on net carbon reduction, which is a function of the efficiency of the heat pump at the current outdoor air temperature conditions and the current cleanliness and efficiency of the grid. Another configuration to consider in the air to water heat pump system is the use of a dedicated heat recovery chiller. If a building encounters enough coincidental load, it may be beneficial to use a heat recovery chiller. When to consider using this option is again discussed in detail in the previous ENL on electrification of heat. You might be surprised to find that the many benefits of using a heat recovery chiller, even when the coincidental loads are not very high, might be enough to consider it. So when a water to water heat recovery chiller is applied in an air to water heat pump system, the heat recovery chiller will need to be staged like any other chiller. Whenever there is a call for simultaneous heating and cooling, the heat recovery chiller should be staged on. If either the heating or cooling system require more capacity while the heat recovery chiller is in use, then an additional heat pump will be staged on in its respective mode, just as previously discussed throughout this section. It should also be pointed out that the heat recovery chiller, when operating, will lower the return water temperature to the main cooling plant and raise it to the heating plant. If the primary water flow is operated at a constant design flow, then the heat pumps will not be allowed to fully load. If the capacity of the heat recovery chiller is small compared to that of the heat pumps, then this consideration may be negligible. But at larger heat recovery chiller design capacities, control strategies might need to be put into place to increase the flow through the primary loop when operating the heat recovery chiller in order to fully load the heat pump chillers. Alternatively, dedicated heat recovery chillers can be arranged in the system to be preferentially loaded, as opposed to side stream, so as not to lower the return water temperature to the heat pumps. This topic is discussed in more detail in previously published trained engineers' newsletters and application manuals. Last, let's consider one more variation to the air to water heat pump system configuration, this time applying a cooling only air cooled chiller to the system. If a building has considerable cooling only operating hours, it will most likely be more cost effective, both in first costs and operating costs, to designate one or more chillers to be cooling only as a cooling only chiller will be more efficient than a heat pump chiller. As you can probably see by now, understanding the staging scenarios of when to stage and when not to stage the various components of the air to water heat pump system is key to designing a plant control sequence that is both reliable and resilient. In this cooling only example, the cooling only chiller should be designated as the lead cooling chiller and called upon to run first on a call for cooling under normal conditions. As with any of the scenarios that we've just considered, having a building automation system with a proven and tested plant control application is critical. Standard plant control sequences that consider failure recovery, equipment rotation, and chiller sequencing should be the foundation for reliable air to water heat pump system control. Building upon this foundation, the various staging sequences that have been discussed can be added in order to provide an effective and resilient system control sequence. Let's summarize what we just learned. Give priority to the heating or cooling modes of the heat pumps based on outdoor air temperature or other criteria as determined by the operation of the building. Maintain the manufacturer's minimum return water temperature for heat pumps operating in the heating mode. 
ensure that water always has a path to expand and contract. And last, consider additional equipment configurations for increased flexibility and efficiency. Now that we've covered the basics of air to water heat pump control, let's see if we can find some other creative ways to provide electrified heating with even more flexible and innovative systems. Rick, can you help us out? I sure can, Brian. Thank you for providing these awesome control strategies for air to water heat pump systems. These will go a long way towards maintaining sustainable systems. Now, as we mentioned earlier, air to water heat pumps have low ambient temperature limits and in addition, Finding enough space on a site can be problematic, especially in dense urban environments. One solution to these issues comes through leveraging heat within the building using thermal energy storage in a stored source heat pump system. This system enables a broader operating range including higher hot water temperatures at much lower outdoor ambient temperatures. Compared to an air to water heat pump system, a stored source heat pump system uses both the outdoor air and the building as an energy source and sink. The system uses existing equipment technology, including chiller heaters, air to water heat pumps, and thermal energy storage tanks. Note that chiller heaters are just chillers that can control to the leaving hot water temperature. Also recall from our 2022 ENL on thermal energy storage that by sizing the air to water heat pumps to manage the thermal energy storage capacity over time, rather than sizing them just for the peak heating demand, enables significant downsizing. This makes air to water heat pumps more feasible in dense urban environments. Stored source heat pump systems include a heating distribution loop, a cooling distribution loop, an air source sink loop, and an energy transfer loop containing the thermal energy storage tanks. Air to water heat pump units source and sink energy from the air for the energy transfer loop and can also provide chilled water to the distribution loop. Chiller heaters provide hot water to the heating distribution loop by extracting energy from the energy transfer loop, in turn freezing the tanks. The thermal energy storage tanks can collect energy from either the air to water heat pump, the building, or both, which we call cooling with ice. And their capacity is controlled by the BAS. The BAS also coordinates air side economizer operation so as not to waste beneficial energy now if needed later. Operating modes from the distribution loops perspective include cooling only, heating only, and simultaneous heating and cooling. In cooling only mode, where only the cooling loop is being served, cooling can be provided by the ice tank as shown here, or the air to water heat pump, or a combination of both. Then we have heating only mode, where only the heating loop is being served. The heating loop will always be directly served by the chiller heater which sources energy from the thermal energy storage tanks alone as shown here, or the thermal energy storage tanks in combination with the air to water heat pump. Lastly, we have simultaneous heating and cooling, where both the cooling and heating loops are in operation. In this mode, the thermal energy storage tanks will be both a heat source and a heat sink. This mode starts to get a little more complex, and we will discuss it in more detail soon. But the good news is the air to water heat pump helps balance the energy transfer loop between the heating and cooling loops, which as we'll see shortly, removes a lot of complexity from the control system. System control must also account for equipment limits. We mentioned air to water heat pump defrost cycles earlier. And another important consideration is its low outdoor ambient temperature limits. If the energy collected during the allowable air to water heat pump runtime along with the building cooling waste heat isn't sufficient to store enough energy in the thermal energy storage tanks for the daily heating demand, additional heat input is required. Additional heat input in the air source sink loop using steam, waste heat, or other sources of heat can be used to collect heat into the thermal energy storage tanks over time. We refer to this low level heat input as trickle heaters. Again, for these and other situations, the equipment and BAS must coordinate operation. A comprehensive cooling and heating control strategy will include sequences, points, and instrumentation. Next, Brian will walk us through some specific control strategies. Thanks for that great introduction to the storage source heat pump system, Rick. 
Before we go much further, let's take the opportunity to build on some of the definitions we discussed earlier. These additional definitions will be useful as we start to talk about system control. In the storage source system, as Rick had mentioned, we will use the thermal energy storage tanks to provide both cooling and heating. In a simple, intuitive sense, we will use ice in the tanks to cool and water in the tanks to heat. More on that in a bit, but let's first consider a couple of definitions as they apply to the cooling mode. From the cooling perspective, we will charge the tanks when we make ice and we will discharge the ice from the tanks when we melt the ice to provide cooling. Conversely, from a heating perspective, when we melt the ice, we collect heat and when we extract the heat energy out of the water, in turn creating ice, we dispatch heat. Though these two sets of definitions are the same, since we are always either sinking or sourcing heat, no matter the scenario, for the sake of clarity, it helps to have the two different sets of definitions when talking about a storage source heat pump system. To help solidify these definitions and get us ready to start thinking about storage source heat pump, let's consider a traditional ice storage system used for cooling. At night, when the building is unoccupied and the system is ready to start making ice in the tanks, say from 9 p.m. to sometime early the next morning, it's not uncommon to think of this process as storing energy in the ice tanks. We are, by all accounts, using electrical energy to make ice, so it would seem logical that we are storing this energy. Continuing with this idea, then during the day, when cooling the building, we must be using that energy from the ice to cool the building. But to help us better understand the system, it's helpful to consider energy in terms of transferring heat, which is what we are most often doing in HVAC systems. So let's review our ice system again, this time starting at 7 a.m. with the full tank of ice. As the building requires cooling, the cooling system will transfer heat energy from the building into the ice tanks, melting the ice and turning it into water. At the end of the day, ideally only a little bit of ice is left in the tank, and the tank is primarily water, indicating that all the heat energy from the building for that day is now stored in the tank. We have successfully done our job of cooling the building for the day, but now we must prepare for tomorrow's cooling. So, now at 9 p.m. when we start to make ice, we are accomplishing two things. One, we are finally rejecting the building heat that was transferred into the tanks throughout the day out into the atmosphere. And two, we are creating ice so that we are prepared to absorb tomorrow's building heat into the tanks. Thanks for following along with that example. I know it's helped me better understand storage source heat pump systems, and not to get too philosophical, but it's difficult to control what we don't understand. Rick did a great job of describing the various distribution modes earlier. In addition to those modes, we also need to consider the thermal energy storage modes to help us complete an understanding of the system control. In order to ensure that we have enough heat sink or source capacity in the tanks, we need to be able to either make ice or melt ice. So back to our definitions. First, we need to be able to actively charge or make ice with the intent to cool. This is done by running the air to water heat pump in ice making mode. Next, we need to be able to actively collect or melt ice with the intent to heat. This is done by either running the air to water heat pump in heating mode or operating the trickle heater. Of course, as a result of heating or cooling the building, we will also be passively charging or collecting. From the perspective of the building loads, we would say that we are dispatching water to heat or discharging ice to cool. Charging and collecting can be thought of as active modes, as commanded by the automation system, to either make or melt ice using a piece of equipment. In dispatching and discharging are purely the result of the system loads at a given point in time. The rate at which the system is dispatching or discharging will need to be considered when determining when to actively charge or collect, which we'll discuss in more detail soon. But before we get there, let's discuss the energy transfer loop, the portion of the system that ties all the pieces together. The energy transfer loop, along with 32 degree ice from the tanks, help to give us an anchor for our system. Let's look at a simultaneous heating and cooling example to help bring it all together. Starting with the water leaving the ice tanks, the water is at a blended 42 degrees. After the cooling loop, we can see that the blended temperature in the energy transfer loop has been raised to 54 degrees, 
meaning that heat energy has been added to the loop. The water will then enter the chiller heaters, and after leaving the chiller heaters, the temperature will have dropped down to 49 degrees. This makes sense, as heat was absorbed from the energy transfer loop, pumped up in temperature through the chiller heaters, and transferred to the heating distribution loop. The 49 degree water now continues back to the thermal energy storage tanks at a temperature warm enough to melt the ice in the tanks. This tells us that the net system load is cooling dominant, which will ultimately melt the ice to provide cooling. By simply looking at the temperature entering the ice tanks, we can tell if the system is heating or cooling dominant. Let's continue to explore this as the system shifts from cooling dominant to heating dominant. As less heat energy is absorbed from the building through the cooling loop and the temperature leaving the cooling loop drops to 50 degrees, the temperature in the energy transfer loop will also drop. As more energy is transferred through the chiller heaters and into the heating loop, the water temperature returning to the energy transfer loop temperature will continue to drop even more, in this case down to 40 degrees. Because the thermal energy storage tanks are the anchor for the loop temperature, and the energy transfer loop is a continuous iterative transfer of energy, the return water temperature into the tanks will eventually drop below 32 degrees as we shift from cooling dominant to heating dominant. As we start to freeze the water and create ice quicker than we can melt it, we are ultimately extracting the heat out of the water. So in summary, if we are freezing the tanks, we currently require more heating than cooling. And if we are melting the tanks, we require more cooling than heating. This all comes back to 32 degrees being our anchor. There is very little control required to try to maintain a specific temperature in the energy transfer loop. The temperatures are simply a function of the energy that is being transferred between the distribution loops, the thermal energy storage tanks, and the air to water heat pumps or trickle heater if they are operating. With that in mind, the energy transfer loop pumps need to operate in a way to ensure that energy is being successfully transferred through the system. And there are only a few considerations to keep in mind. First, if the cooling loop is operating, the energy transfer loop pumps need to keep a slight positive flow through the decoupler. Next, the pumps need to operate to provide the design flow through the operating chiller heaters. And last, when charging or making ice, the pump should operate to provide design ice making flow through the tanks. If any of these modes occur simultaneously, then the pump should operate to satisfy the maximum of the required flows. It should also be noted that a chiller heater maximum flow bypass can be installed if the system design would ever incorporate more flow through the energy transfer loop than the maximum design flow of the chiller heaters. So as we just observed while walking through the energy transfer loop, ensuring that we have enough ice in the thermal energy storage tanks for cooling and enough water in the thermal energy storage tanks for heating is critical to the operation of our system. This leads us into control strategies for maintaining the correct ice and water levels in the thermal energy storage tanks. Many predictive models could be used to determine tank levels, but the following example provides a basic starting point for the system designer. During summer months, when very little heating is required, the goal will be to have nearly a full tank of ice at the start of the day in order to use ice for cooling and supplement with the air to water heat pump as necessary. And likewise, during the winter months, when very little cooling is required, the goal will be to have nearly a full tank of water at the start of the day for heating and supplement with the air to water heat pump is necessary. And for spring and fall, it might be the goal to start each day with a tank that is half full of ice and half full of water. It should be considered that an additional predictive element comes into play during the winter months. If the outside air temperature is going to be cold for an extended period of time and the air to water heat pump capacity is going to be limited, decisions will need to be made to determine when to operate the air to water heat pump along with the trickle heater to ensure that enough heating water capacity remains in the thermal energy storage tanks. Though the previous example used to determine ice level was a simple step function based on the time of year, other methods such as the following could be used. Predictive load based on predicted building occupancy and weather conditions. Self-learning algorithms where a building load changes are learned and a model is built. Detailed energy monitoring where sensors are used to determine the energy flow in all control loops or any combination of these concepts. One last source of heat that we must mention, as Rick briefly stated, is airside economizing. 
As an esteemed colleague of mine has often said, the cheapest BTU is the one that's already in the building. In cooler outdoor air conditions, economizing should be disabled in order to collect the heat from the building back into the thermal energy storage tanks. Again, as in the previous discussion about predictive tank level control, several predictive models could be used to determine when to disable economizing. Following is a simple example of when economizing could be disabled. Disable during peak winter heating period, which could be an adjustable time frame from December 15th to March 1st, based on your climate zone. Additionally, if any time during the occupied hours, there is a need for thermal energy storage heat collection, the airside economizer shall be disabled for the rest of the day. What? I need to take back the mic for a code checkup. Brian, I think I heard you say disable the economizer, and I'm wondering if energy codes even allow that. ASHRAE 90.1 requirements provide some guidance towards answering this question. A prescriptive requirement named Economizer Heating System Impact per Section 6514 states that HVAC system design and economizer control shall be such that economizer operation does not increase the building heating energy use during normal operation. For stored source heat pump systems, economizing to satisfy cooling demand on days where there is a heating load would throw away the heat into the ambient air, thereby increasing the heating load on the mechanical system. So given that interpretation, I would say that Brian's recommendation to disable economizing is pretty solid. And this 90.1 requirement has been in place since at least the 2007 version, so it applies in most states. So back to you, Brian. Thanks for that great catch and clarification, Rick. Now let's take the heating dominant system discussed earlier one step further into heating only mode, including collecting heat with the air to water heat pump. At some point, the air to water heat pump may need to defrost one of its outdoor coils as discussed earlier, which could disrupt comfort heating. Let's discuss control tactics to address this condition for a moment. During a defrost cycle, a properly sized hot water buffer tank in the heating distribution loop will primarily be used to ensure heating comfort. Alternatively, an auxiliary boiler could be used as a heating resource. In either case, specifying a heat pump that can signal to the building automation system when defrost is about to occur, along with receiving a signal back from the automation system to negotiate the start of the defrost cycle given its ability to stage up other system heating resources, can greatly increase the controllability and resiliency of the system. Also, recalling that the BAS system must account for equipment limits, the trickle heater will be used to preheat the return water temperature into the air to water heat pump as needed to meet its operating limits during the defrost cycle. Before we move on, let's do a quick recap. Heating and cooling loops are controlled independently and this decoupling greatly reduces control complexity. The storage source heat pump energy transfer loop and thermal storage tanks help to balance the heating and cooling loads. Again, reducing controls complexity by not having to use controls to try to manage the instantaneous heat balance. Use a proven control strategy anywhere from simple to complex to control the ice level in the tanks. Now that we've learned more about the control of the storage source heat pump system, Rick is going to provide more insight around system options and selections. Thanks, Brian, for bringing clarity to what can at first seem like a complex system to control. Now that we have a handle on the system design and control, I wanted to note that the system options we mentioned earlier can also be added to the stored source heat pump system. Meeting a range of application objectives can sometimes require auxiliary heat, dedicated chillers, thermal buffer tanks, and in the case of stored source heat pump systems, a trickle heater. Guidance for configuring options and sizing components can be found in the train application guides. These figures show annual heating and cooling load profiles versus outdoor ambient temperatures for a select sampling of building types and climate zones. Opportunities for typical heat recovery in the air to water heat pump system depend on the amount of simultaneous heating and cooling loads, which are shown in the blue triangles. While the office and outpatient building examples are good candidates for heat recovery, the school with its higher ventilation rates is likely not. Given a stored source heat pump system with its inherent ability to recover non-simultaneous loads, you can imagine how much more heat recovery is available. 
Also, focusing on the office load profile with its significantly higher cooling load looks to be a likely candidate for dedicated chillers. The point is that each of these applications could be met by either the storage source heat pump or the air to water heat pump systems, and each can be adapted to incorporate the desired option. Again, guidance for configuring options and size and components can be found in train application guides. When applying some of the system selection criteria mentioned earlier to the air to water heat pump and storage source heat pump systems, we can start to discern a choice. While there is no right system, the owner's project goals will guide decisions. Given the selection criteria shown, stored source heat pump systems can be applied in colder climates and produce higher hot water temperatures, while air to water heat pump systems can be easier to control. In either case, carefully engineered sequences are important for reliable, flexible, and efficient operation. Great guidance, Rick. We'll wrap up this section on stored source heat pump with a few short topics. First, let's transition our discussion to applying ASHRAE Guideline 36 control sequences, specifically the trim and respond methodology to the air to water heat pump and storage source heat pump systems. A separate upcoming ENL that will be available later this year will focus completely on Guideline 36. So we'll use this time to discuss it briefly as it applies to these systems. As we've seen, both the air to water heat pump and storage source heat pump systems include traditional primary secondary systems. So guideline 36 pump pressure reset sequences can be applied to control variable secondary pumping systems. This can be applied in the same fashion as any traditional plant system, using water valve positions as requests to determine when to trim and when to respond the pump pressure reset. Additionally, trim and respond can be used to reset both hot and chilled water set points either in conjunction with pump pressure reset or independently. You are encouraged to keep an eye out for the upcoming ENL on Guideline 36 to learn more about trim and respond and how it can be applied. To finish out, let's wrap up this section by discussing instrumentation and control points. As you've realized, there are a significant number of temperature sensors shown in the energy transfer loop of the storage source heat pump system, in addition to the typical temperature sensors in the inlet and outlet of the equipment as well as the hot and chilled water system loops. While much of the instrumentation is used for system status, there are some sensors that are essential to the successful control of the system. As discussed in this previous section, sensors will be required for the control of the energy transfer loop pumps. As for the thermal energy storage tanks, accurately measuring the ice and water levels in the tank is required to determine when charging or collecting should occur. Next, Measuring the flow in the energy transfer loop can be very useful. Coupling the flow with the temperatures in and out of the loops can be used to calculate energy in the various loops, which in turn can be used for monitoring, system analysis, and control strategies. Coupling hydronic energy with electrical metering allows for the measurement and tracking of overall system efficiency. Now to help us walk through how these sequences, control points, and instrumentation can be documented and specified, Let's turn it over to Ken to talk about Train Design Assist. Thank you, Brian. That was some great insight around the chiller heater system control strategies and operation modes. Now we're gonna take the next few minutes to show you how you can leverage the productivity tool, Train Design Assist, to help you when you're developing controls designs for your chiller heater system. Train Design Assist is a productivity tool for developing building automation system designs. We wanted to make sure that you are aware that we've incorporated the chiller heater system applications and control strategies that Rick and Brian have discussed today into the Train Design Assist tool. Before we go any further, some of you might be saying, what is Train Design Assist? Train Design Assist is a productivity tool developed by Train to assist our customers when they're laying out their controls, designs, and strategies for their HVAC equipment, applied systems, and building spaces. This web-based complementary application can be leveraged to create vendor agnostic controls construction documentation. As you are aware, controls designs are constantly evolving to keep up with efficiency standards, ASHRAE guidelines, and government regulations. Train Design Assist was developed to quickly bring these updated control strategies to our customers. This web-based application 
gives users the power to create repeatable designs, to collaborate with other project stakeholders, and to export accurate construction documentation to use in plans and specifications. Project documentation can be exported in PDF, DWG, XLS, and DOCSX format types. Shown here are some examples of some chiller heater system control flow diagrams that could be configured based on user selections, including the systems that Rick and Brian presented earlier in the engineering newsletter. Train Design Assist configuration options provide an opportunity for users to create a wide variety of system designs, including the possibility to automatically add air to water heat pumps, dedicated cooling only chillers, auxiliary heating, or a dedicated heat recovery unit. One point of clarity on the storage source heat pump flow diagram. Rick mentioned that storage source heat pump applications require a trickle heater in the air to water heat pump system loop. Recall that this is different from an auxiliary boiler, which is much larger and typically located in the heating distribution loop. An important distinction in maintaining system flexibility and reliability. This is an example on how users create scalable designs on a digital canvas. They use the right hand configuration pane to select their desired control design strategies. As the user selects their control options, the flow diagram design on the left automatically updates to reflect the configurations. The tabs along the bottom of the screen can be used to access the sequence of operation, points list, and project guide specifications for the item being configured. All of the project item content will automatically update together based on the controls design configuration selected. As a result, the content across all tabs will be matching. Now we're going to take a little closer look at the tool's functionality and demonstrate how you can use it to quickly generate controls design documentation for your unique chiller heater system. You can access Train Design Assist by logging on at traindesignassist.com. First time users will need to use the create an account feature to get started. When you log into Train Design Assist, the tool will redirect you to your personal project list page. This page will contain a list of all your, of your existing projects. From the project list page, you can create a new project or open an existing project. When the project is opened, it will take you to the design canvas. At the top of the page, there is a design library of project items and systems available for the user to bring on to their project. The library is divided into folders to make it easier for you to locate the project item. In this case, we will select the chiller heater system from the system library folder. When the chiller heater system is selected, it will be placed in the project hierarchy pane on the left. The tool will provide you with a list of components that are complementary to the system. Select the components that fit your design and drag them out onto your design canvas. As you drag these items onto the design canvas, they will also be populated into the project hierarchy pane and placed under the chiller heater system. When a system or a project item is selected on the canvas, or selected in the project hierarchy pane on the left, you will notice that a configuration pane opens on the right to provide you with controls design options to configure your system. In the configuration pane for the chiller heater system, there are two chiller heater system types to choose from. An air to water heat pump system or a storage source heat pump system. When you select the system type, you will notice that other controls design options start to appear in the configuration pane based on your selection. 
As you continue to advance down the selections in the configuration pane on the right, you will notice that there is a controls design selection for the number of heat pumps that you would like in your system. When a controls design configuration is selected, design documentation for the chiller heater system will be now populate into content tabs along the bottom of the page. These content tabs include the flow diagram, the sequence of operation, the points list, and the item guide spec. Let's navigate to the flow diagram tab to see what has been created based on the configurations that have been selected. In this example, you will notice that the chiller heater plant has two air to water heat pump in the design. The tool currently provides a selection up to four heat pumps although more pumps could be added through the tool's customization feature. When reviewing the chiller heater flow diagram canvas, you may need to zoom out to see the entire plant. As we zoom out, you can see there is also a chilled water distribution loop and a hot water distribution loop on the canvas. As you proceed down through the configurations in the pane, Equipment and control devices will continue to populate on the flow diagram. There are design selections for a number of heat pumps desired for each of the distribution loop. In each example, a dedicated cooling only chiller has been selected. As you can see, it was added to the chilled water distribution loop. When you navigate to the sequence tab, you will notice that the sequences have been populated to describe how the system and the control devices are designed to operate. As you can see, there are sections on pumping strategies, equipment staging, and more. The sequence of operation for the chiller heater system contains many energy efficiency strategies, including a pump pressure optimization sequence based on ASHRAE Guideline 36, trim and respond logic. The cooling mode addition and subtraction sequences will be updated to reflect your control selections. As Brian mentioned earlier, if a cooling only chiller option is added to the design, it will operate as the primary cooling source to satisfy the building load. When you are in the sequence tab, viewing the sequences for your system, you will notice the right hand configuration pane is still available for selecting controls design strategies. There is an option to add auxiliary heat to the system. When you select it, it will be added to the auxiliary heat section into the control sequence. The configurations also provide the capability to add a dedicated heat recovery chiller. When we navigate back to the flow diagram, you will notice the auxiliary heat populated into the heating distribution loop, and the dedicated heat recovery chiller has been inserted between the two distribution loops. This was a quick overview on how you can use standard control selections from Train Design Assist to help create your own unique chiller heater system. There may be times when your chiller heater design cannot be completed through the standard configurations. For those instances, Train Design Assist offers a customization feature. If you decide to use the customization feature, you will be disabling the ability to change the design selections you had previously made. When you enter the customization mode, you will notice that the selections are now grayed out and cannot be changed. When in customize mode, the tool provides users with a custom toolbar and a shaped library of control items that can be used to customize the flow diagram. A customization example could be if a user wanted to modify their chilled water distribution loop by adding a heat exchanger to provide primary and secondary isolation. A heat exchanger flow shape could be dragged out from the shape library. The user could also add necessary piping and control devices to their flow diagram. These items can be resized or rotated as needed to satisfy your design. 
Also notice that an existing shapes on the flow diagram can be repositioned, duplicated, or deleted. Users can also add custom text to their flow diagram by using the custom text shape in the toolbar. Design documentation on other content tabs can also be customized. The existing sequence of operation wording can be modified. New sentences or entire sections can be added. Changes can be saved or discarded. Control points can be updated or added on the points list. And modifications can be made to the guide specification. This was a quick overview on how you can customize your chiller heater system design. There is also a sharing feature that has been incorporated within the application to allow users to collaborate with other project stakeholders by sharing their trained design assist projects electronically back and forth with each other. When the user is on their project list page, they will be provided with a share feature that will allow them to send their project to another user to confirm their controls design selections and to help eliminate design and scope uncertainty. Other users can be invited as reviewers with a read-only copy or be allowed to perform save as of the project for editing. Okay, let's do a quick summary. As we demonstrated, Train Design Assist can be used to quickly generate controls documentation when designing your own chiller heater system. This web-based application gives users the power to create designs, to collaborate with other project stakeholders, and to export accurate construction documentation to use in plans and specifications. As mentioned, the chiller heater system applications and control strategies that are outlined in the chiller heater system application guide have been incorporated into Train Design Assist tool to assist users when they are laying out their controls documentation. You can access Train Design Assist by logging in at traindesignassist.com. For more information on Train Design Assist, please take a few minutes to view the YouTube video that covers some key features and benefits. Also available online is a step-by-step self-paced training course. It is posted on train.com, so it is available to both train employees and non-train users. An in-tool help document is available to assist you through the design process. Back to you, Rick. Thank you, Ken, for the thorough introduction to this very interesting productivity tool. Well, as we mentioned at the outset of this ENL, customers are asking to use heat pumps and regulators and utilities are increasingly incentivizing them to decarbonize buildings. Today, we've covered a lot of ground towards simplifying some of the more complicated heat pump systems with innovative control strategies. These strategies will ensure high-performing systems using relatively simple control logic, as well as highly reliable systems by adhering to equipment limitations. And our overview of Train Design Assist demonstrates that it has significant potential to reduce controls design time and improve the quality of design documentation. So that's our program today. We hope you found it a helpful way to learn about control strategies for electrified chiller heater systems. Please fill out a survey and let us know what you thought of today's program. As always, the bibliography included in your handout provides more information on where to find a number of resources related to today's topic, including the application guide we referenced. Or contact your local account manager for specific information on train systems, equipment, controls, and services. For those of you viewing in person, please ask your local host about details for the upcoming Engineers Newsletter Live programs. The program lineup can also be located at www.train.com enl. Finally, for those of you seeking continuing education credit, check out the newest online courses at our self-paced learning portal. Thanks for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next time.